So last week, what did we talk about? Making a move. Making a move. You know what this week we're going to talk about? Making a move. Because <laughs> like, like Mallory said, sometimes redundancies very much required. Inculcation is needed where we hear things over and over and over until it sinks in. I know when I was at the refinery, when they would train us, every training manual, every step was repeated six times throughout that training process. Because they said, after six times of our brain hearing things, we tend to retain it. We got five more weeks. <laughs> Make it a move to T double O, T O O. Either one applies. Critical action over comfortable compromise. Critical action over comfortable compromise. So, like we were talking about last week, it's not just important, not only is it important that we hear from God, it's important that we act on what we hear, right? Because what good is it to, to, re, to receive information if there's never application of the information? So if we never apply what God's saying to our life, then what good did hearing God's voice do? It would be no different than hearing someone else talk or, or listening to the radio or whatever we do. But, I, you know, the Bible says that, that, that or Jesus said that if, if he had written down everything that, God wanted to say, then the world couldn't contain the books. So what God did choose to say and what God did have written down is obviously important. So when God said it, we need to take note of it. And especially the things that God repeats. So we, we're to not only be hearers of the word, but what? Doers of the word. Not only hearers, but doers. So you can be on the right track and get run over. You know that? You can go out there on I-10 and go 25 miles an hour, and chances are you're going to get run over. Especially nowadays. I remember in times past, I, I know if my grandfather was still alive, he'd have probably got run over by now. Because he never went fast anywhere. Usually if I'm going down Gulf Highway and there was a long line of cars, I would just about bet that he was in the front. But in the day that we're living in, if, you, if you're not keeping up, you'll have to get run over. And I don't know if you've ever traveled from Houston to Dallas, but if you get on I-45 and you go 80, you might still get run over. Why did I say that? We're going to get to it. I said that because I really believe that there are a lot of people that are fulfilling roles in ministry that they weren't God's first choice. I believe they're filling roles that God had already spoke to someone else to and they waited for the right moment and they waited for the door to open and they waited for the situations to get right. And the next thing you know, God said, oh man, just here you go. Because that one ain't ever going to move. They acted. The ones that are in the, in the role acted. And weren't just a hearer, but a doer. Many are, who are seeking a word from God have been replaced by those who acted on a word from God. I'm going to say that again. Many who are seeking a word from God have been overtaken, overrun by people who acted on a word from God. Just like that car driving 25 miles an hour on the interstate. God's saying get somewhere and we're just waiting for the opportunity. There are many who are anointed, gifted, and equipped but live ineffective, unfruitful lives because they will not move. They fail to act on what God has told them. Do you want to live a fruitful life? 
Anybody? Besides that, anybody want to live a fruitful life? What, what's, what's our mandate? It goes all the way back to Genesis 1. What did God, what's the first thing God ever told man? Be fruitful and multiply. It hasn't changed. He said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? So if his command back then was be fruitful and multiply, then today his command must still be be fruitful and multiply. So that's what we're supposed to be doing. And, and it's not just in, in uh, procreation, but it's multiplication of, of believers. We're supposed to bear fruit, bear much fruit, the scripture says. Bear much fruit. That means reproduce according to your kind. That means if you're a child of God, if you're a Christian, then you reproduce other Christians. You lead people to the Lord. That's a fruitful life. Our life should bear much fruit. There should be many others who are like us because we shared the gospel with them. Not just if we stand behind a pulpit, but I'm not even, that's not even my goal when I'm back here. It shouldn't even be my goal here. That should be my goal out there. My goal here, the pastor's job is the equipping, the equipping of the saints for what? For the work of the ministry. That's what the word says. So I'm supposed to equip you when I'm up here. I'm supposed to be equipping you to go out there and do the work of the ministry. But somehow we've got it turned around where we think this is the work of the ministry. This is the equipping of you for the work of the ministry. Now, when I step down from here, then I have to go out and do the work of the ministry. Right? That's out there. Y'all with me? Y'all awake? So your silence is just like all in expectation? Okay. All right, we're going to go with that. So, like I said, there are many who are anointed, gifted, and equipped, but live an ineffective, unfruitful life because they fail to act on what God's told them to do. Many more, there are many more, who sit back in a comfortable life and never even seek the will of God at all. Listen, there are many more who sit back in a comfortable life and never really seek the will of God at all, but fully expect God to bless their plan. I'm not, I promise, I'm not fussing. And like I said, I have to be the first partaker of this before I can share it with you. So don't, don't take this as me fussing at you. This is what God spoke to me. Therefore, before it can apply to you, it had to first apply to me because he spoke it to me first. Right? Yeah. So take, just take what the Lord's saying and don't think about who this applies to. Take it for, take it personal. Take it for you personally. Brother Holton used to say, come to church with a spoon, not a shovel. Don't say, I know who that's for. Take it as, hey, that's for me. So I can't just sit back and expect God to bless my plan, the plan that I conjured up in my mind, when God has a plan that he's already blessed and I have to hear his voice and then choose to walk in that plan. And then I walk in the fullness of the blessing of God and I'm not weaving in and out of his will and back into my own will like, like a drunk going down the highway at night. So the problem is that with sitting back and, and not really seeking the will of God, that one day, the problem with it is one day, we have to give an account. One day I'll stand before him and I'll have to give an account for the life that I lived and everything he entrusted me with and what I did with it. And here's what scares me the most out of that. Natalie won't be there with me. It'll be me and him. And, you know, you can, you can read that in the book of Revelation and you get a picture of Jesus. It's kind of intimidating. With the flames of fire and a sword coming out of his mouth. And, and I'm going to stand in his presence alone. And we're going to talk about what I did with what he gave me. And that's sobering. That's really, really sobering to me. So he gives a, an account of this, Jesus does, in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. He says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far off country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, 
And we probably all know the parable of the talents, but I'm going to read it anyway. Because I, I want us to, to look at it in a different light. It, this has been used to be applied to all kind of things. But I want, I want it to be, you think about, this is going to be me. And I'm going to stand before Jesus. And I'm going to give an account of what he trusted me with. My, this is a talent, was a sum of money. But it's also the talents that he's placed within me. It's the giftings that he's given me. It's the anointing that he placed upon me. It, it's, it's everything that he entrusted me with. It's every ability that he gave me. And now I'm going to stand before him. So he said to some, he gave, one he gave five and one he gave two and to another one one, each according to his own ability. So you can look out over everybody you knew, you know and see how God has entrusted to each one with different things in a different way. And it all goes back to their own abilities that he placed within them, right? And immediately he went on a journey. And he who had received five talents went and he traded with them and he made another five. So what was he? He was fruitful. He reproduced what the Lord had entrusted him with. So he took his talents and he invested and he made five more. And likewise, he who had received two gained two also, two more also. But he had received one, went and he dug a hole in the ground and he hid the Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came to settle, to settle accounts with them. There's coming a time when he's going to settle accounts with each one of us. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more beside them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over few. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And he said to the one who had received two talents, or the one, the one who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents beside them. Then, he's, then he who had received two talent, or one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. But the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. This, when I printed this out, there were some things that got omitted. So I'm going to paraphrase that. So the one who had uh, received two talents, he had invested and increased by two talents, doubled, the, doubled his money, and he gave it to the Lord. And the Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant, just like he had with the one who had given five talents. He said, now, enter into all. He said, since you've been faithful over the little, I'll make you ruler over much. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Then he comes to the one who he had given one talent, and he said, Lord, I knew you were a hard man. You, you reap where you hadn't sown, and you... All that that I read, he said, I took your talent and I hid it in the ground. I buried it in the ground. And Jesus goes to say, you wicked and perverse servant. You ought to have deposited my money with the bankers at least. And coming, I would at least got it back with interest. So he's, what did he say to that guy? He said, take that one talent from him. And gave it to the one who has ten. Because he knows what to do with it. And then it goes on to say he said. And cast that unprofitable servant out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we'll all stand before him. And give an account. Over what he's invested in us. So there are many theological views. Of whether that's hell or not. And I'm not getting into all of that. I've got my own idea. But, but what I do want to point out is that there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's not going to be a joyful time. When what's revealed to us of what we didn't do with what God gave us is revealed to us. And I think... I think we'll all be in that place to some degree because I don't think there's anybody who really did everything they could have with what Jesus entrusted with them. And so, but think about that. Weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. I believe when we see what we could have done with what he gave us, in that place, 
completely, ap- op- uh, completely absent of fear? Because when we get to heaven, there's no fear, right? So when we're in that place and we're absent of fear and we tr- see, tr- truly see without being skewed what we could have done, I think it's going to bring a very um, regretful time. I think there's going to be a lot of weeping at that time. I think if we see where how things could have changed, if we would have made a move, I think it brings that realization of this is what Jesus really provided for me and I never really acted on what he trusted me with. I'm thankful for this. That we have a promise that Jesus said, I'll wipe away every tear. And I really think that's what those tears are about. The realization of what we could have done with what he gave us. If we would have just acted on it. But I'm thankful that he said, I'm going to be there. Because I think at that time, he's the only one that could comfort us the way we're going to need to be comforted. And I think it's that time of, okay, now you saw, now you know. Now come here. Let me wipe those tears away. Now enter into everything I prepared for you. For a child of God. He said, it said here in Matthew that that wicked servant hid the talent in the ground, in the dust of the earth. How did God make us? From the dust of the earth, from the ground, right? So I'm going to ask you this. What have you buried? What have you buried? What has the Lord trusted you with, entrusted you with? What giftings, what abilities, what talents, what calling, what special anointings has God entrusted you with that you've hidden down inside of you that nobody even knows about? Maybe you don't even know about and you're going to have to seek the Lord for him to show you. You ever find out you have an ability that you didn't even know you had? I think I shared this a couple of weeks ago, but a few years ago, we'd gone to the Angola Prison Rodeo several years ago, and we went on a tour, and uh, we were looking at all of the artwork and the woodworking and the leatherworking and all that stuff that these guys had done. Did I share this last week? No? But I, I remember saying to the warden, I said, it's amazing how much talent these guys in here have. And his response to me was this, most of them never knew they had this talent until they came here because they were pursuing other things. But if they would have taken a moment and said, Lord, what's in me? What giftings have you placed in here? What's my calling? What What do you have for me to do? I think the Lord would have pointed out. I know he would have because why would he keep it a secret? So I'm going to ask you, you're not, you're not in prison. But what have you had? What, what's hidden in you? What's hidden in you that nobody knows about? What, what is it that God trusted, entrusted to you to help build his kingdom, but you, it's been repressed down inside of you, buried in the ground of your heart? I think it's those things, when we stand before Jesus, that will be revealed, that cause the tears to flow. See, our enemy is all too often not the thief that comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. But it's usually our own lack of effort. It's usually our own lack of of forward motion. Our own lack of movement that causes loss in our life, that causes us to never walk in what God really created us to, to, to do or possess or to operate in it's like brother Holton used to share a story about a farmer who had been working all day in his field and it was hot and he leaned against a pole and he took out his handkerchief and he was wiping the sweat from his brow and a car driving down the road stopped and this man from the city got out 
And he looked at the farmer and he said, look at this beautiful field that God's made. And the farmer looked at him and he said, yeah, but you should have seen it when God had it by himself. <laughs> so there's things that God desires to do, but it takes us getting moving forward, right? It takes us putting some things into motion. It takes some effort on our part. It takes us moving. We have to take critical action. We have to take critical action. Critical action is acting on the things that really need to be done. That's critical action. The things that really need to be done today, I'm going to focus on them. Do you have some things that really need to be done? But how much of our time is spent doing the things that didn't really have to be done? And our focus goes from the thing, instead of focusing on the things that really need to be done, to the ones that aren't so critical. And they take up our time. And they use up our energy. And they use up our resources. And at the end of the day, the things that really needed to be done weren't done. And the things that didn't really matter have taken up the day. Critical action. Critical action involves taking risk. Paying a price, sticking your neck, neck out, jumping in with both feet. Critical action is tougher to take than just action. It means I, I got some skin in the game. I got some stuff on the line. And I think that's where God wants us. I think that's where God wants us. Because if, it, it's, if, if, we don't, if we're not in over our head, it probably wasn't God. Because the things that, that we can do on our own, we don't need God for. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I think God wants to get us to the place where we have to depend on him. I had that conversation with God when he called me to pastor. I said, God, I don't know what I'm doing. He said, I know. That's why I called you. Because if you could do it on your own, you wouldn't need me. Natalie and I were driving yesterday. We, uh, Josh and Leah had taken us to lunch, and we were driving home, and I just told her, I said, God's so amazing. God's so amazing. And that, that, that started because of a conversation that we had Wednesday night when Miss Tanya asked me a question. She said, how do you get your sermons? And that caused me to start thinking. I said, I don't know. I don't know. Because here, here's the thing, that is, God's so awesome. When, I, when he called me to pastor, my response was, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. And I said, I can tell these people everything I know in one sermon. How do I go on for years? I don't know enough to go on for years. So I have to trust him that he's always going to provide. And he always has. Now you can tell when I start to influence it. Because it goes like this. My analogy, this is, this, is, this is the analogy that I got that brought me comfort. So we have animals. We have dogs, a cat, horses, all that. And when we're going out of town, I have to find somebody to feed for me. All right? So whoever it is that feeds for me, I don't expect them to buy the feed. I've got more than enough feed already provided. All they have to do is go give it to them. Okay? And that's the, that's the way the Lord uh, comforted me in that is, he said, I've asked you to feed my sheep. I don't expect you to provide the food. Thank you. Because that just lifted a whole lot of weight off of me. Now, if somebody's feeding my horses and they feed them something that I didn't leave and it's something they're not used to having, it'll kill them. So if I feed you something that the Lord didn't provide for me to give you, we have to make a move. We have to act on the critical things in life. We have to take critical action. We often surrender to comfortable compromise. More talking than walking. That's how I would define a critical compromise. It's more talking than walking. You know people that talk more than they walk? 
You know, do you know anybody that if you hear them talk about what they do, they sound like they're amazing at it until you see them do it? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Don't point at anybody. Comfortable compromise is we do something, just not the full extent of what God told us to do. We do something. Just not the full extent of what God told us to do. We take, we, 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 we take action, just not the action he said. We go part of the way, we just don't go all of the way. And it's a comfortable compromise. God said to do this, so I'm going to do something, I'm just not going to do that. Comfortable, comfortable compromise is very dangerous because it eases our mind and it satisfies our conscience. That's what makes critical, critical I mean, uh, comfortable compromise so dangerous. Is, look, if God's told me to do something and I haven't acted at all, it'll start to wear on me in here, right? And I'll, I'll start to, I'll get uncomfortable. And I know the only way to get comfortable is, is to go and do what he has he's instructed me to do. But if I compromise, if I say, well, instead of doing that, I'll just go do this. It eases my conscience, and now I feel like the weight's lifted, and now I, don't, I may not ever do that. Do you, you follow what I'm saying? Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm going to give some examples. We fool ourselves into thinking we did the will of God. So I'm going to give a couple examples. Y'all want me to use people out of the Bible and not us? Because if I use people out of the Bible, we can say, yeah. We wouldn't have done that. But I'm not going to talk about us yet. I'm going to look at some people in the Bible first. David and Goliath. Y'all know the story? So Saul was the king of Israel, right? And Saul had been sitting in the shade on a hilltop as this uncircumcised Philistine stood in the valley cursing the God of Israel. What was Saul doing? He was looking for a way to compromise. Let's, let's work this out, man. We don't have to fight. Let's, can't we all just get along? So he was sitting in the shade trying to come up with a strategy now, do you think he knew what had to be done? Do you think he knew somebody needs to go down there and take care of that dude? I think he knew that. He just didn't want it to be him. Now, whose place was it? He was the king, wasn't he? Now, let me ask you this. Do you think if Saul on day one would have stood up and grabbed his armor and his sword and walked down in that valley that God would have delivered that giant to him just like he did David? I think he would have. But Saul wasn't too quick to jump in there with both feet, was he? He was a whole lot more at ease standing back and saying, man, I wish somebody would do something. God, would you provide for me a giant that I could send down? Lord, would you tell me, would you give me a strategy? Would you give me a, a plan? And you know the whole time God's saying, walk down there. Grab your sword and go down there. But Lord, would you give me whatever? So David, when he comes on the scene... David took critical action. He wasn't looking for a comfortable compromise. Compromise. He took critical action and he saw what needed to be done and he, went and he took the head from the giant and he brought it back and he rolled it up at Saul's feet and he said, now what was that stuff you said you were going to give me? <laughs> Wasn't there some prizes that came along with this? But he recognized that someone had to take critical action. And then he looked back at his life at, at past events. Look, I encourage you, 
when we talked about that a little bit a while ago, when, when, when problems come, instead of saying, woe is me, you say, thank you, Lord, and because somehow you're going to turn this and, and use it for my good. You're going to bless me through this. Write that down. Write that down because there's going to come a day. You might have you might have defeated that lion. But it's not going to be too long from now that a bear is going to come. And when the bear comes, if you can look back and say, well, I remember when the lion came. That's what David did, right? There was a day when a lion came and I grabbed him by the beard. And then a bear came and, and I, I dealt with him the same way. So who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Just like God delivered the lion and he, just like God delivered the bear, he's going to deliver him to my hands as well. And so he let his victories in the past propel him toward the critical action. Because what did he do? He jumped in with both feet, right? He put his neck on the line. Because if God didn't come through, he wasn't going to make it. And that's what God wants us to be. God wants us to be a people who aren't afraid to take critical action because we know our God's coming behind us to stand behind us and to fight the battle for us. Man, I don't want to preach this. I'm going to be tested in this. Saul didn't learn his lesson that day. Because when he went into battle against the Amalekites God told him what to do and it was pretty intense but Saul compromised again and he partially did what God called him to do or instructed him to do but he didn't completely fulfill what God said God told him to destroy everything but he said man that's a good looking cow. Yeah. Those are nice camels. And those are beautiful women. And you know that king, he's not so bad. And so he started bringing back spoils. And then so God said, wait a minute. Because of your comfortable compromise, because you're traveling down the interstate at 25 miles an hour, there's somebody over here who acts on what I tell him to do, so I'll just have him overtake you, and I'm going to pull you off the throne, and I'm going to put David on it. That's how it went, right? So that brings us to us. So now I'm going to make it a little more personal. You love me? Okay. All right, let's get that out there. I love you too. The Great Commission, Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, who's the he here? It's capital H, that's Jesus, right? If you, if you looked up, this up in your Bible, it's probably going to be in red if you have a red letter, letter edition. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So what did Jesus tell us in that? He told us to do two things in the Great Commission. Go and preach go and preach two things two simple requests but yet we often do everything else to reach the lost except go and preach the church spends billions of dollars with a B I'm talking about the church universal Billions of dollars on programs and events. Not against programs and events. I think they're great. I think we need them. But they don't replace go and preach. We create committees and teams. We have fun. Hey, we meet the needs. We take care of the, the widows and the orphans. To some extent. We reach out. And we outreach. But all too often, we fail to go and preach. I'm not talking about back here. I'm talking about out there. Because up here is just to remember, it's equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. The go and the preach don't happen here. It happens out there. And at the end of the day, because of our committees and our outreaches and our 
all of the things that we do, at the end of the day, we feel good about ourselves because we served, we helped someone, we were nice, and we smiled. Look, I know sometimes that, that's hard. Sometimes being nice is difficult. Everything, everybody's not easy to be nice to. Right? Amen. And I'm not, I'm not trying to minimize any of these things. I think we ought to do all of those things. But it can't stop there. My ministry can't stop with be, me being nice to people. And my ministry can't stop with me seeing a need and going meet it. It also has to improve, include me telling somebody about Jesus. The biggest compromise that I believe we've allowed in the church is this right here. Your life is the greatest sermon that somebody will ever hear. Is that truth? Yes. yes. But it's not the whole truth. We can't stop there. Because that's a compromise. If I start thinking, me just living a Christian life in front of everyone else is good enough, then I miss the Great Commission. I miss what Jesus told me to do. Because I can live as good a life as I want to live, but if I'm not going and sharing my faith with somebody else, I missed it. Why is it quiet? Thank you. Thank you. It's a, comp it's a comfortable compromise that if I can convince myself that if, if I'm just living a good Christian life, that that's good enough. And that's the only sermon I ever need to preach. If I convince myself of that, it takes the pressure off of me. My conscience is settled. And I go, Whew, I'm doing the work of God. But if it doesn't include me going and preaching, then I missed it. And when I'm talking about preaching, I'm not talking about standing behind a pulpit. I'm talking about sharing your faith. That's what Jesus is talking about. He wasn't, he wasn't sending these people out to go build churches and, and all of that stuff. All of them, right? He was telling them, go out there and do what you see me do. The things that you saw me do, you go do. Sometimes preaching means laying my hands on someone who's sick, asking if I can pray for them, sharing my faith with them, telling them what Jesus did for me. Has Jesus done anything for you? Has he done anything for you? Then you have a testimony, right? And we overcome how? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. It's amazing. All of this time, money, effort that the church has, has used, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to beat up on the church. That's the bride of Christ, and that's the last thing you look. If you want to get on my bad side, talk negative about my wife. So I'm not trying to 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 bash on the church. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is, I think we, as as as, as someone who is in leadership in the church, I think that we've spent so much time and money and effort and, and energy into programs and, 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 and we missed it because even though we do all these things, the attendance in churches globally has dropped. Every year it goes down. So we have to look back and say, whatever we're doing, it isn't working. So we have to get back to say, okay, what, what is the model that Jesus gave us? Go and preach. Go and preach. I think if we could take what we have here and bring it to where we work, to where we go to school, into our home, into our family, into our neighborhood, wherever it is, then that's how we become an effective church. Look, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about all the ones that didn't come today. So just rest easy. No, that's a comfortable compromise, right? All those things are good. Teams are good. Committees are good. Programs are good. Events are good. Helping others is good. Blessing people is good. Living a good Christian life in front of them is good. And we should be doing all of them. But those things have to lead up to us going and preaching. Now, it doesn't do any good to go and preach if you're going to be a jerk. Right? Right? If you're going to treat people terrible, it doesn't do any good to tell them how good Jesus is and then you, t you tear them apart. So we have to live up to it, but it has to include us sharing our faith. 
We have to get out there, jump in with both feet, stick our neck out, and get uncomfortable and tell people about Jesus. Sharing our faith isn't always comfortable. And it's not always easy. But it's something we have to do. It's our commission. It's what, what, what Jesus asked us to do. Or told, not, not asked, commanded us to do. It's about our priorities. Do we really have or have a sense of urgency for reaching the lost? Do we really have a sense of urgency for reaching the lost? How many believe that we're getting pretty close to the rapture of the church? I, I think we are. If God don't do something soon, I think he'll owe Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. So we agree on that. So here's, here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to get your thinking away from just come, Lord. Just get me out of here. To Jesus coming back soon. I've got to do something. Because if he comes back now, there's a lot of people I know that are going to hell. So we have a responsibility to share our faith. We have a responsibility to share Jesus with other people. Because if, if we don't have a sense of urgency, then I'm not really worried about it. But if we get a real sense of urgency about Jesus is coming back soon, i got to do something. I've got to share my faith. Well, then that changes things. It goes back to our priorities, right? I'm going to ask you a question. I don't want you to answer it. I just want you to think about it. How many people did you tell about Jesus this week? Did you share your faith? Did you do the things that you see in your Bible that Jesus did this week? Did you walk that out? I got to ask myself this. I'm not just quizzing you. I'm asking me too. Because it's... I could step down from here and just go live life willy-nilly. Or I can really do what God called me to do, not just on Sunday, but all week long. And I think if, if we answer that question and say, man, I didn't share my faith with anybody, then we really need to make ourselves aware of our situation. We really need a sense of urgency. Because if we really believe the word of God like we said, and we really believe that Jesus is coming back soon, that ought to prompt us to action. Are you just waiting on God to open a door? Are you waiting for him to speak to you, to tell you, to share your faith with him? Because he already has. It was up there. He already has. He's already spoke that to you. It's written in the word. Are you really waiting for him to open a door for you? Bubba shared something with me one day. He was talking about business. But this definitely applies right here. It applies to kingdom things just as much or more than business. He said, what I do, he said, I wait for God to crack a door. And he said, when God cracks it, I kick it off the hinges. Well, what if we took that approach in our Christian life instead of just saying, I'm just waiting for God to open the door. I'll do it, Lord. I'm just waiting for you to open the door. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose a question to you, and I want you to think about it. And it goes back to our priorities and our sense of urgency. If someone came up to you and told you, I'm going to give you $1 million dollars. One million dollars. Think about that. One million dollars for every person you lead to the Lord this week. Would it change how you share the gospel? Would it put more urgency? Would you be more apt to share your faith? Would you see more doors open? I think we would see so many more openings to share the gospel if that was 
a reality. But how much more important is a soul for eternity than a million dollars? Because believe it or not, a million dollars goes pretty quick. But I think it would change our evangelism approach. If it would, if someone offering a million dollars for every soul you win to the Lord changes, would change your outlook on evangelism, it tells us where our priorities are. That hurt. I wish I wouldn't have said it. But it does. It changes. It, it, it reveals where our priorities are. So do I put more priorities in money than the than a person's eternal salvation? Hmm. We have to act on what God has said. We have to make a move. We have to act on what God has said and make a move. Amen?